Paul was from Colossae, you know, at the time in bonds. He was probably in Rome, right? Which yeah. is, so, I mean, Onesimus is on quite a journey to go see Paul. Yeah. Quite a journey. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not like you going from here to, from here to Disney World, you know. Well, but you'd have to wonder, too, if, if Onesimus is the tent tent was to go see Paul, or if in his travels he came across Paul and said, oh, I know that name. You know what I'm saying? You don't... It's just, you don't... So we can conjecture all night on that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's some of the things we see. But also we see in verse, I think it's... Well, it's pretty much, yeah. But uh, I was, I was going to look for something a little more, but... Uh, you just see it in uh, verse verse 15. He says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Eventually they get him talking. Eventually they ex everything is explained. But at, at some point, you know, Paul is is told, but you know, on top of everything Paul already has to do, you know, the care of all the churches, all the situations that all the churches, whether it be the Galatians, the Romans, the Ephesians, the Colossians, the Philippians, uh, all these people have run into all these different situations. Uh, now, and, uh, and that's when this comes to Paul, and then this is one more burden that falls into his lap that he has to handle. So, is, do you really think he has to handle it, or he chooses well, no, to handle no. it? Well, no, no. I mean, he he can he can, can kind of he can he can say, "I don't want to do any of this." Yeah. But he, but as far as his mindset, he has the mind of he's, he's you know Saul of Tarsus wouldn't handle any of this. Saul of Tarsus mm -hmm. would reject all. Of it and say Jesus isn't even the Christ, but Paul would handle everything gladly and give his life for service to Christ. And I'm, he's, our, he's our pattern, so we should also do the same. Let's see, so, so yeah, so that's the things that we see, but, uh, but yeah. So we see that there's there's this issue there where we find that there's Paul, and with already you know, the care of all the churches, multiple burdens going on, and then Onesimus comes in, saying what he says. But again, this is you know an open conversation where when we ask the question, you can feel free to add in your thoughts as well. So and that's what we're doing all night. It's what we're doing concerning and considering what Paul says about Philemon. You know, and this epistle. So, so we see that there, and some of the other questions you come across are, how would that differ from somebody involved in the world religious system? Anesimus runs away from Philemon instead of running to Paul. He runs into somebody who's in the world religious system rather than, rather than Paul. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good question. It's a loaded question. I mean, if you, I mean, if, if Onesimus ran into your average local church. Or you could even say, you could say into, what was it? You say into like a, the Pharisees or Sadducees or, or you know, which was the religious system at that time. Oh, at that time. Or, or anything. Or anything. Probably throw him in a dungeon because he broke the law. Well, yeah, that's that's pretty much you know where I'm kind of going with this, yeah. Because you have you've got Paul who has the doctrine and the mind of Christ, the grace of God, who would handle the situation gracefully, versus someone who would do exactly that, plug themselves into the world system, plug themselves into the world at large, and probably take an estimate and do exactly that, throw him, throw him in, throw him in jail. Allow the situation to get worse. Uh, would, they'd probably find an SMS because, as we said, and in one of our studies before, we said that uh, the economy of the Roman Empire was based on such things as slavery. And if you had you know, caused a rebellion as a slave, or if you had caused a you know, runaway, caused injury or incident to the you know the master that you were serving for the amount of years you were doing it, then that would be something that would be worthy of punishment or fines or fees, and instead of Paul handling things in a graceful manner, handling things according to the grace of God that was given to him, and the revelation of the mystery that was given to him, he 
he would instead, or somebody else instead, would most likely plug themselves into the world's rules, the world's ways, therefore not handle things. We wouldn't have the epistle of uh, Philemon. We'd have something else. We wouldn't have this. We wouldn't have anything. We'd have, we'd have a prisoner, so to speak, rotting away instead of uh, uh, understanding of grace and action. Don't you have to make a distinction, though, between a servant and a slave? Because if you're a servant, if you're a servant of somebody, you, you chose to be that servant. They didn't sell you into slavery. You weren't sold into slavery to this person. So if you're a servant of this person and you say to yourself, well, I've been a servant for two years, that's enough. I'm going to go out back on my own. And Yeah, well, I guess as we look at this, yeah, because I guess as we went through the topic of slavery, a lot of people out here even today, they would look at the Epistle of Philemon. They wouldn't, they wouldn't set up a difference between slavery, servant, everything else. And that's why we had to go through the study of slavery. We had to touch on that topic say that you know, he was a willing servant under the Roman Empire based on the economy uh, Onesimus was. And you know, he didn't like it. He signed up for it and then just said, you know, I don't like this. And that's why he ran away versus what you see in Israel where they sign up and they do what they do and, and their masters have to treat them well. Even in, under Old Testament law, they have to do that. And sometimes they break that law and they're just fine and keep that. And then there's the American history of slavery that we have just based on our nations and what we've gone through. And that was a terrible thing that happened here. But again, we've got that distinction where we have what we have and they have what they had and we have what they had. And I mean, there is a distinction between servant and slave. So yeah, yeah John verse 16, he says, not now as a servant, but above a servant. Right, so... Yeah, just uh, don't don't think it's uh, something you don't need to speak on. You can any, anyone has any thoughts, you can go ahead and include them into what we're doing. Yeah, you can just chime right in. Yeah, please so, chime. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're just uh, going through some basic uh, thoughts, questions on the Book of Philemon so far. So uh, let's see. As we go through this, we're seeing some other things like how do you think Paul applied grace to the situation? When Philemon showed up on his uh, doorstep, quote unquote, as he was under house arrest, you know, what say what verses or what uh, well, what was his mindset in which you know he applied you know, grace to the situation? I know probably there are others who have a thought on it. I'm just going to mention mine. My thought, real quickly, is one of the ways Paul showed grace is if if uh, he knew Onesimus. Left by Lena, he could have. He was in jail all the afternoons by turning on Esmus. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's certainly one way to show. And he besieged the right. Yeah. Absolutely. And another one I would say is uh, if you go to Ephesians four thirty two, it's a good verse. Yeah. I'd say Paul remembered this as an estimate showed up on his doorstep. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It'd be a good thing to remember, a good thing to plug into the situation. Just food for That's thought. Pretty much is grace to some extent. Yeah. Well, one of the aspects of so how we apply it. Yeah. Yeah. But if there's any other thoughts, feel free to say anything you like. That's kind of what we're doing tonight. So yeah, you see that there. We see it also in uh, verse twelve. He calls, he calls Philemon his own bowels. He's no longer referring to him, uh, I'm sorry, Onesimus as his own bowels. He's saying that uh, Onesimus is no longer a runaway servant. He's his own bowels. A good thing. His identity.
something. Uh, verse 16 goes on, you know, with his identity. And he's saying that he's not, you know, not as a servant, but above a servant. You know, a brother beloved. Calls him that. Both in the flesh and in the Lord. And he says, receive him as myself. That's that's a huge deal. And the more you think about that, the more you see that Paul is saying to receive this runaway servant as if he were myself. So that's Paul. Again, being, yeah, he's saying, you know, he's receiving a, you know, a situation uh, on top of all sorts of situations that he's already got. He's, he's applying grace to him. So, as we're just considering what Paul says, uh, you know, about Philemon, about all these issues in Philemon, we're looking through the mindset of Paul in these situations, how Paul would handle these things, how Paul would go through these things. And we're kind of looking at this accordingly. And any thoughts you may have? Feel free to feel free to bring him up. So, so we see that. And so uh, another th question as we're going through this is, you know, is it possible we can see ourselves as Paul in situations? Uh, you know, daily based in our life. And we have to be the one to fix what somebody else might have broke or somebody else might have done. And now we the uh, Paul in this filing situation. And now we have to fix what somebody else did. And uh, it's charged upon us to fix something else that we didn't even do it. But we're charged to fix it. So, you know, or, or we'd have to oversee it, wisely put it back into, uh, bring it to conclusion, to fix whatever somebody else made wrong. Graceful, or at least on purpose, put it back into its proper place or fix it up better than it was before, that kind of thing. These are just the kind of things we're looking at as we kind of see how what Paul might have gone through. Yeah. So. But these are the, uh, these are the questions we're looking at. Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, lots of times in uh, daily situations, we kind of go through these. and uh, Lots of time burdens get, get put on us, even as grace believers, especially as grace believers. We get thrown things, put on our lap, and we're here to handle it accordingly. But lots of times, we're, it falls our pattern to uh, handle these things and go about it as, as needed. And uh, I think we already answered this, but, you know, how did Paul use his freedom of choice to handle the situation? And could he have chosen not to handle it? And of course, the answer is, yeah, he could have we already went through this just by going through the questions. That uh, he, would, he could have chosen not to handle anything, but of course, that would mean he's not handling things as the Apostle of Christ. So, so we see that there. But this is just the first, it's a first set of questions, looking and considering what Paul has to say about Philemon. So. So as we can see, we're kind of seeing this through Paul's perspective. And uh, again, this is just an open conversation. Anyone can bring up you know, anything as we consider what Paul has to say about Philemon. But we're kind of moving from Paul, from Paul's angle of viewing things. And it's good that we see these things that we see because we want to look at this situation through how Paul would have to view these things. In Philemon, we're going to move in now into how Philemon would have to deal with the things of Philemon. Now we're kind of moving into a part where you've got a mature or a maturing saint. And as he's given the situation from Paul, now we're going to see things, or at least try to answer some questions. And you can answer these questions any way you see fit. In fact, it's, you know, the more, more the better. Uh, you're seeing things through the perspective of Philemon instead of from Paul now. And now Paul comes to you, or Paul comes to Philemon, and says, I'm giving you a situation that fell in my lap. And he's, you know, here's a tough situation from Philemon. And now he's essentially saying, I need you to bring this to its proper conclusion. And so I guess you know, one of the questions would be, what do you think Philemon thought when Onesimus first fled from him?
Turn anything. Yeah, that's I had a thought. I mean, I would have to, you would have to almost assume that Onesimus didn't go to Philemon and said, this is it, I'm done. Yeah, yeah give us two weeks notice. Or yeah, give us two weeks notice. So, I mean, Onesimus decides to disappear. Philemon had to wonder what happened to him, I would think, or where he went to. So, you know, Paul's writing Philemon a letter saying, oh, you remember Onesimus, this guy? You know, he's, you mean, Paul? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, Paul's probably a letter. Can you remember that guy in SMS? He's, he showed up at the jail saying hi to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess initially, uh, when uh, Philemon first, first hears about uh, an SMS, you know, first fleeing from him, uh, some, some tips are in verse 10, it's a random example. He says, you know, I beseech you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. And he's saying, which in time past was to the unprofitable. So he might have thought, you know, this unprofitable guy, for example, this guy, run, this guy, you know, runs away from me. And I think where is it also in verses, uh, uh, you know, verse 15 says, perhaps he therefore departed for a season. So he knows this guy departed. He knows this guy ran away. And verse 18 says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, so he, he when this guy, when Onesimus ran away from Philemon, Philemon said, oh, this guy most likely you know, could have been angry. This guy wronged me or he owes me. This guy departed from me. He could have turned into something like that. And of course, we're, we're also trying to learn from the words that we're finding on the page. That's our point. We're considering, again, that's the point of what we're doing tonight is we're considering what Paul says. You know, or we're considering the words on the page from Philemon. But again, we're kind of seeing what, what, what was Philemon thinking? Possibly. We're kind of digging into their mindset. What was Paul thinking? What was Philemon thinking? What was Onesimus thinking? You, know? well, you can kind of think with, too, with Philemon, maybe some of his uh, fellow servant holders and stuff like that, you know, spoke with him and suggested, you know, do you need to find him and drive him, throw him in jail? And, you know, so there could have been some confusion on. Uh, you know, Philemon's part, being a saint, he would hopefully look at it with a more graceful uh, attitude, but maybe not initially. He might have felt betrayed. You know? It could, have been, it could have been some confliction where he knew what the grace of God said, and yet, like you said, his neighbors or his fellow... Yeah, his peers. His peers were saying... of his church in the house. Yeah, yeah, well, he did no. have a church, and he does have a church in his house. That's true. Philemon would, does have a church yeah. in his house, saying, "Let's obey the grace of God and, and God through Jesus Christ and what He has to say." And yet, you've got peers probably out there, fellow servant holders, saying, "If I come across this guy, I'll get him." Yeah, and you need to beat him, or you need to throw him in jail, or you need to. Yeah, yeah. Because, like you said, there might have been some repercussion. Yeah, when he was sent back. Could have been, could have been, yeah. yeah. Oh, there definitely would have been in, in, in the Roman Empire. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> apparently the jailers didn't know that Onesimus was a servant that left. Yeah. Because if they had known, they might have arrested him and threw him in jail along with Paul, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Any other well, thoughts on this? I, I think Philemon had a right to be mad. I mean, it was righteous anger. He was sinned against. Um, it depends, you know. He had to he had to temper his anger in a godly way. But I, until Onesimus apologized um, and sort of, you know, make made some amends, I can see where he could be angry as long as he didn't sin because yeah. he was sinned against. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, this is kind of where we're going with this is exactly just just comments like that, open thoughts like that. That's kind of where we're going tonight, just digging into Philemon like that. But uh but yeah, yeah, when an SNS first fled from Philemon was probably like uh, angry, upset, you know, saying, you know what, you know, 
Uh, he's got to uphold, Philemon has to uphold the doctrines of God, and yet he just normally, naturally would say, you know, this guy wronged me, this guy owes me, this guy, he's my, he's my uh, servant, and he chose to run away from me. And probably some kind of financial loss. Yeah, could have been, could have been financial law, because yeah, just as we said, uh, servitude was the economic factor, one of the economic factors of Roman Empire. So yeah. So I think my first Paul asked me to forgive him well, it would be a little bit maybe shocked or surprised, or I would have to take myself by the neck, by the collar, and say, okay, you're going to have to forgive. But it would it would have been a little hard at first, I think. Yeah, yeah, and even even forgiveness would be I can I can forgive, but I do need to teach. Yeah, there still can be consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not good. As Paul Paul later asks in verse eighteen, if he has wronged me or oweth the God on account, so you know, even though Onesimus came in financial damage. Paul says, if he has, put on my account, I'll pay it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Even if, even if on the way out, uh, Onesimus, you know, breaks a few tires on the on the Toyota. <laughs> you know, I think you have a Ford one fifty or Ford or one fifty or whatever. You for, truck, essentially, truck. Paul's saying, you know, put put that on my account yeah. rather than his. I'll, yeah. I'll Make sure to cover his cover really your pay losses yeah, through me, really through him. Yeah. So that that puts Philemon on the spot because you know now it's it's, it's not a matter of that it. anymore. Yeah. It's not the financial issue anymore. Yeah, it's about forgiveness now. Now it's about forgiveness. Yeah. How how graceful is Philemon willing to be towards Paul, not Onesimus? Oh, really? Or, or both? Yeah. yeah. And so now we plug ourselves into this situation because the same same question comes up again is it possible we see ourselves as Philemon earlier we were asking can we see ourselves as Paul saying okay I'm going to, I'm going to burden somebody with a huge situation now can we see ourselves as Philemon saying that there's a Paul out there and this per you know Paul let's say it's Steve Yoke let's say it's uh you know, somebody else, they look at this big situation. I'm giving it to you because I need you, you and your usefulness to handle this situation that I need to put in your lap. You know, can you see yourself as Philemon needing to handle it and saying, look, this person has caused a situation. He's now a brother in Christ or she, depending on you know, the, the issue. And I need you to make it right. You didn't even cause the problem, but I need you to make it right. When it come down to it in the situation, it's it's really Philemon and Onesimus that has has to work together to work it through. Yeah. Paul's interceding and making it right, but if the two of them have to make it work. But imagine the thoughts now that may come through your head as a grace believer. You're 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 in your Bible. You're studying. You're doing everything that would be quote unquote correct, right, accurate, and yeah. Paul comes along. Or Justin comes along, or Steve, or you know, whoever you want to put in the place of Paul in this day and age in 2022, says, "Look, uh, Jack the Ripper. He's now Jack the uh, Jack, Jack the Forgiven, and, <laughs> and he's. I, I need him to stay in your house for about a week, you know, you know until he gets back on his feet again." And you're like, Whoa. "Say what?" Yeah. No, no, that sounds a little extreme. Yeah, and because that's you're I mean. asking him to put. No, yeah, but I mean, you're asking. I assume it's as a killer instinct. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's yeah, true. That's that's what I mean. That was yeah. a little extreme. Yeah, yeah, that's but true. Let's not, let's not go that's that. Not, that's a safety issue. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. So. Well, plus, if, if, Ones, if Onesimus came back with the same attitude he left, it would be a different situation. Yes. There would have to be punishment, and that would be right. Yes. You know, yeah. there would be harder consequences, but because of the grace, because he's now a brother in Christ, that could soften Philemon's heart, um, mm -hmm. especially if he understands grace, having a church in his home. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But and you would um, expect it to, actually, yeah. You would expect but it. But you don't have to 
say he, it doesn't say he's one that sits in the gate type of a thing, but say he has, like we talked before, he has peers, he still has to face them. I'm sure these the servants talked among themselves with other servants. And he's yeah. have to sort of explain himself to these other people that weren't Christian and didn't understand grace. Yeah, which could be an opportunity in itself. Yes. Could be. Yes. yes. But you, you, I mean, put yourself in Onesimus' Onesimus's shoes when he was Paul at the prison, and he's got this long back to Philemon. I can't imagine what kind of thought to is that about, you know, yeah. what's... <laughs> That's the next set of questions. How does he handle this? You know? and, and that's and that's the thing. As we get into their thoughts, and again, we're not really in it. We don't we don't have verbatim what thought, but just try to consider what they thought. You get more into the book of Philemon a little bit, just a little bit. You get there into the context a little more. You get into their thoughts a little bit, and say you don't know it per, verbatim, but you're kind of putting yourself in their shoes as much as you can. And that's what we're that's what we're doing. We're kind of seeing the grace it takes if you're trying to be the Philemon in one situation and Paul in the other situation and Onesimus in the other situation. You're seeing the grace that it would take to go through this. And that's all we're doing tonight. That's all we're trying to apply. So. But yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, with Philemon, we see that there. And it's possible we can see ourselves as Philemon. And I guess uh, the other thing, as you know, the second part of this question is is uh, kind of where we just went. Is could you receive a previous, let's say, enemy? Not really an enemy, but if he did wrong you and owes you and parted from you, uh, could you receive back a previous enemy, someone in your life you would say is a wrongdoer, someone who has done you wrong? You know, this person has done you wrong, and uh, now a strong, mature ambassador has said that this person who's once done you wrong in your life is now a saved individual. He's my own balance. He's a brother beloved. She's a sister beloved, whatever it is. Could you receive him back if you were asked to by this? You know, that's, that's the... I would think if Philemon, if Philemon was thinking according to grace, he would be rejoicing in what he got back with Onesimus because it's much more than what he lost because maybe Onesimus was a troublemaker. Maybe Onesimus was, uh, uh, you know, upset his household. Maybe he had a bad attitude, but now he's a and a servant. And we know that some servants became the Old Testament when they, you know, or the, not in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, when uh, some of the soldiers wanted their servants <laughs> Healed that type of thing, so uh, he he could have much more with Onesimus now yeah. than he ever had before. Yeah. Well, yeah, the Gospels are Old Testament. Uh, yeah, that's true. true. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, you're right. But, yeah. So yeah, that would be that's uh, that's an excellent point. That's 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 great to see that there. So, but yeah, so we have that, and then uh, let's see Philemon. So yeah, so we're kind of seeing this as we go through and we see things through Paul's perspective, we see things through Philemon's perspective, and then we'll kind of move into Onesimus, like we said in the last part. Uh, you know, we're looking at Paul, we're looking at Onesimus, then we jump into, or we're looking at Paul, we're looking at Philemon, now we're going to Onesimus. Now we went from uh, Paul being, you know, the pattern, the apostle, the mature saint who was given a tough situation, and we had to resolve it by giving it to another because he was under house arrest. With the Philemon, a mature or further maturing saint who was given the tough situation, uh, and who had to resolve it and get to conclusion. Now we're looking at Onesimus, a saint who's in the tough situation, and he's dependent upon the mature saints to resolve his situation. So you had brought this up before, but you know what kind of thoughts you th he's going through his head as he was first, you know, making that making that run for. It. As he, whether it be he's, it hits the stroke at midnight and he's leaving, you know, one, two, three. I would, have to, I would just wonder, and this doesn't really answer your question, but I would wonder what it was that made him leave, you know, and whether he was, like you said earlier, maybe he was a 
a disruptor, or maybe he was a troublemaker, and he just felt. Well, it does say uh, in verse 11, <coughs> and time passed was to the unprofitable. Now, if he was, and I believe he was a Christian saved individual running a Christian household, church in his house and everything. So he probably wasn't being a, a harsh individual who had, he had servant's house, he was running a house. <laughs> Why would Onesimus just have to seek out Paul? He had to seek out Paul. You don't run into somebody in jail unless you're seeking them out, or unless you got thrown in jail yourself. And by coincidence, they just happen to be there. So, well, as I as I kind of think about it, and this is again just my thoughts. I couldn't line it up with the Bible. But if Onesimus, I'm sorry, if, if Philemon to Paul and Paul is writing to Onesimus, or maybe if Philemon has met Paul and they've spoken and he's helped the church in his house, again, just thinking about just possibilities that are maybe out there. I don't, I can't verify that, but these are just why we're talking tonight. If Paul wrote to him or if Paul went to him prior to all this and helped the church in his house to grow, or someone else came along, maybe maybe even you know, say Epaphras, or or somebody else came along. Timothy came along, and they said, "Well," and, and the servants are watching. Who 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 sent you here, Paul? How do you know all this? I learned from Paul. How are you able to help so many people? I, it's because of Paul. How are you able to make this church so sound and strong from Paul? And the name keeps coming up. Who's this guy? Well, that's 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 all true. However, how would, how would Onesimus know where Paul is? Yeah. I'm sure there was more than one jail in Rome. Well, maybe word of Paul's whereabouts. Well, his whereabouts because everyone said, hey, Paul got arrested. He's in Rome. Paul got arrested. And there's in the scripture, they hear that people sought out Paul diligently and they found him. But you know, there was no electronics or anything. They had to literally go find it if, if people wanted to go find somebody they had to go looking for them for weeks and then eventually well, they find I'm sure them. i mean like i said even the journey from colossi to rome and then you know you make that journey when you get to rome there's got to be more than one jail in rome so yeah you go start asking you know where paul is you know you're probably not getting a response from people in rome because you still had jews in rome unbelievers probably and not everybody in rome was a believer well, yeah, even because even in even in uh, the Book of Romans, you got Jews, you got Gentiles, well, you got sure. the body of Christ, you sure. got unbelieving Jews, you got unbelieving, unbelie you got all, you got all, you all kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. I Maybe mean, the grapevine was the only way they had for communication back then, so that what probably was pretty good, pretty pretty effective. Yeah, possibly, possibly. Well, if something caused something caused Onest to run away, whether he was a hothead. Whether he didn't like Christians and was irritated by Philemon in the church in, the, in his house, or um, and then when he got out there like the prodigal son and found out the world wasn't so great out there, and thought back to the Christians and how they treated each other, and even my boss Philemon treated me well, better than they are going out here, and then. Maybe I should, you know, maybe he had regrets and repented and thought about the examples he'd seen and knew that if he went to Paul, uh, he could find the same love there and maybe help him get back. Yeah. And so that's, that's, a, great that's yeah. a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. That's very possible. You know, that's not far fetched at all. Yeah. And what was the other was uh, in there? Uh, because there was, I was just thinking of a point. I'm trying to find where the verses are that explain. Uh, it's not Trophimus. It's not this guy. It's another one. Um, who's the one that ran away? The one that ran away. Uh, is it Demas? It's Demas. Where's Demas? Demas. Oh, yeah. Demas. Because at least Onesimus runs away and comes back. Demas, he's saved and he just runs away. I think it's, uh, demons have forsaken me. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, 
Second Timothy. Yeah, Alexander and somebody else he mentions. Oh, Timothy yeah. mentions in that. Yeah, chapter 4, 10. Titus, Titus, I guess it was. Oh, well, chapter Second Timothy 4, 10. Second Timothy 4, 10 says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having, having loved this present world. So Demas ends up just loving the world around him and says, I'm, you know, I may be saved, but uh, Christianity as it is, the church, not for me. I'm, I'm out. This present world is I'm going to have fun in it till the day I die, and I'm, I'm out. At least uh, Onesimus came back. Onesimus came back, and as we know from Colossians chapter 4, he became a beloved, uh, faithful brother in uh, the church at Colossae. So he plugged himself back in, or he all plugged him back in. He made and he amends. was taking a big chance. He didn't know what he would, what kind of reception he would get when he got back, although yeah. he must have known Philemon again with his graciousness and having saints in his house and so on and so forth, how he treated them. But he was still taking a chance because he broke the law. Yeah, yeah I bet that first meeting was a, was a little tense for him. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, do you think that the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon was hand delivered by SMS, or do you think he used Quincy like, Postal Service or something? I don't know. Money. Send it to him, you know. I don't well, know that that was my thought even last Sunday when I asked that because if Onesimus is going back. Well, I'm sure, oh, ahead of him, well, you know. Because I'm sure if five streets before he gets to his house, someone's going to say, there he is, I got him. Yeah, you know, yeah. Unless yeah. he showed up at nighttime or something. Well, yeah. Or, or something, yeah. yeah. So. Well, a lot of questions you can ask, yeah. but you don't get a lot. Of, you don't have a lot of real. No, no, but Substance, it's good to, yeah, yeah, you, you don't, don't have, have any documentation. But yeah. it's good to. This is this is just why we're doing this. It's it's to build up new thoughts, new questions, new new interaction with this book. Is with twenty five verses, it builds yeah. up a lot of questions we never thought we'd even yeah. have. Yeah. And I think too, with a lot of it, it, it's good to ask these questions and to look at it. I'll say this is a little bit more of a secular type of view uh, because I never could figure out what the big deal was with the woman at the well, with Jesus talking to her, until I read something in a historical concept, a book or whatever that said that was a big no-no. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, now I get it. So sometimes you do need to know a little bit of the background, what was going on at the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's doing what we're doing now kind of puts it into a little bit of that. It, you know, yeah. we're speculating, but. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, speculation, everything else we're doing, but we're, we're, you see, as it builds up the context a little bit better, it builds up thoughts. We're kind of seeing that these were, these were real, actual, historical people who actually really went through everything, and they're serving a true and living God, which we are as well today. And we're seeing that this is things that they went through. We're learning from all this. We're seeing the grace in action. And uh, we're seeing how much grace actually had to be put into action based on the situation, based on what they were probably most could have been, most likely could have been thinking. So we see that through everything they're going through here. Uh, but we're seeing some of the other questions would be, you know, what thoughts could, and uh, we kind of just brushed on this. What thoughts could uh, he have had as, as Paul was teaching? This is an Esmus. He was teaching an Esmus. And then he tells, Paul tells him, okay, time, time to go back. So an Esmus you know, shows up, and we see that in verse 12. He says, um, yeah, you know, uh, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him by my own bowels. And then in verse 15, he said to him, uh, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou should receive him forever. And he says he, in verse 10, he begot him through his bonds. So you know, he begot him as in he risen up, as in he was created, he, you know, he was saved by the gospel. So that's probably initially thinking, hey, this is great. I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm saved. I met this Paul guy. And then Paul at some point says, all right, you know, let's go back. So what do you think Onesimus is thinking? Even as a growing, maturing saint by now. He's not the same guy he was as he left. What do you think he's thinking? Being 
gone back. Well, that's why I was wondering, in part, if he actually, if he, if he brought the letter back to Fog Lehman that Paul wrote, you know, if he, if he had the letter in his hand and Paul said, go back, Paul's going to know whether he went back or not. Probably. You know, he, Paul's mm-hmm. going to get the word that, oh, you wrote a letter, but uh, Onesimus never came back, so I never received it. Nobody knows where Onesimus is. I think it might have even been graceful if Paul said, you know, can you, can you do this? Can you need to send Timothy first, a day ahead, and then you'll show up a day later? Well, I, I, yeah, I guess. Or, or Titus or, or yeah, Trophimus yeah, yeah. or, you know. I send somebody ahead and yeah. deliver this letter. And then when Onesimus shows up, things can just smooth over. Or maybe people were different. Than, maybe people then were like, uh, you got this. I know you got this. You, you, you know. Well, I think it would definitely make a difference whether the letter went before him or he went there with the letter because imagine him showing up at the door and a servant going to the door and seeing him. And <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> would the servant try to grab him and hold him or you skunk you? I mean, <laughs> what would be, and if I was Onesimus going back with the letter, I would be afraid of the reaction until they got to read the letter. That's true. That's true. But if they get the letter ahead of him coming, it would be a little more, a little easier, even though it still would be a little tense. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know, we know the future of all this by Colossians 4 is that Onesimus is a faithful and beloved brother. So he does get plugged in. He does find his way back into everybody's good graces. He does work his way to become somebody who is able to uh, monitor the situations of Colossae and teach others about them. So we know the future from all from this situation here is that things do work out. You know, things are God's grace is applied into all this, into Onesimus, and it does work. So and he's received completely back in. It's just a matter of how, how exactly. But, but yeah, yeah, because the door. And have a servant answer it? Does he just go in because he knows the way in and that's been his household? Or do they all jump on him and say, we got him, we got him? I mean, you know, right, right, right. many scenarios there that uh, yeah. play itself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we don't know. We can't. We have no idea. Yeah. So this is just, you know, food for thought and ideas that we're just kind of scrambling through. But it does show how the grace of God works. That in the end, no matter how this played out, no matter what he did, no matter what scenario we try to figure out, God's grace is what came through. Whether whether he did show up at the door and say, okay, I'm here, you can arrest me, whatever. In the end, after everything that played out, if that was the scenario, God's grace came through. Or if Paul sent Timothy a day ahead or Trophimus or, or whoever, that played through and God's grace came through. Or if there was a third, uh, third scenario we're not even thinking of, God's grace came through in the end, and no matter what, um, Onesimus ended up a faithful and beloved brother of the city of Colossae, the church of Colossae. Yeah, and he ended up profitable to everybody. Which means he also had a good day at the judgment seat of Christ. Most likely. I mean, again, that I'm not the judge of him either. I don't. It looks like he would have had a good day at the judgment seat of Christ. So, so we see that, but uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, so and then our next question would be, again, we plugged ourselves into the mindset of Paul, and we plugged ourselves into the mindset of Philemon, and now we plug ourselves into the mindset of Onesimus. If we had terribly messed up, and uh, today's Paul, gave us an instruction like we're seeing with an estimates and says, okay, you need to go back to where you messed up. Um, and again, I can't even think of something where it would be necessarily in the situation of an estimates. But if we could somehow equate it to, you know, we messed up big. How about the part of the sun? 
Well, that's a, that's a good spiritual lesson where we can see that. You know, we go and we we ran we ran off. Uh, somebody Pauline says, "Okay, let's let's get the information into your inner man. Now you're going to go back to where you came from. You can we see ourselves being obedient to that instruction, or would we say, "Well, I kind of like where I'm at. I like, like uh, I already replaced you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, in your in your example too, you talk about a son versus a servant. Someone has much greater standing." Yeah, and that is still, a difference. Still, stop. You know, still. No, he meant he's blood. And I think that's where that, that's kind of where I'm going. This is kind of the same question, but you know, other times when we see ourselves as an essence, you know, we're caught in a tough situation, dependent on the advice or the actual intervention of stronger saints. We need other saints to come in and advise us, or help us, or guide us with right doctrine. We're the ones who are stuck. We're the ones who are, we, we, you know, we're the ones dependent upon the other saints to to guide us in the right situation per se. We're we're the ones who are in a an SMS like situation. That's that's probably the better way to phrase it. I'm grateful he was smart enough to listen to the right person. He could have listened to somebody else who said, "Keep on running." Yeah. Well, yeah, and maybe he did get that. Maybe along the way he, he explained his situation and like came along and, and said, uh, you know, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Wanted poster on the street. Uh, yeah. Up ahead. yeah, you know, you're a wanted man, so. Yeah, could have been. Don't look back. Yeah, yeah, that could have been. So, but again, just to put our, ourselves into that mindset, there's times where we, Get to these, I don't call it that, just, you know, anesthetist type scenarios. We need the stronger to come in and, and I guess it's the weaker brother scenario. You should see that in Romans 14, Romans 15, where we need the brother to come in and rescue us. So, I don't know if anyone, of course, you don't have to explain the situation, but if you ever see yourself in there. That's kind of where we're going with all this. Uh, in order to just dive deeper into this book, kind of put ourselves into the shoes of these guys, the minds of these guys, it kind of takes us from there. So, but let's see. Some of the other ones is, if we go to Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, we're looking to see if we can see this principle applied. It will be Second Corinthians 12 and verse 9. Of course, this is the Lord talking, he says, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, Therefore, uh, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, but when I am weak, then am I strong. And we see there, in this case, and we have probably in this. And then there's Paul. And we see here from verse 10, we see there's necessities and distresses going on. Uh, can we see where this is applied, the glorying and infirmities, uh, when we see uh, Onesimus running to Paul uh, for teaching and help, where there can be a result where they're actually glorying in their necessities, glorying in their distresses, or at least Onesimus ends up doing that, or Paul can glory in that. To the outside world, they're seeing a, a prisoner teaching an escaped servant. That's all it is. That's all they see. One prisoner is teaching a escapee, you know, uh, instructions or information. That's all they see. No one really, if they're not really paying too much attention, people, you know, there's just 
guy that keeps running prisoner's house. He's under house arrest. One guy keeps running in every day to this, or staying with this prisoner every day. And uh, why anybody would do that, who knows? But they're warring and they're distressed. SMS is distressed. And uh, even Paul is under house arrest. And they're, they're reaping rewards for this. Well, Paul being concerned by circumstances or situation, here he was ministering yes. to someone else. He's actually making this work. He's actually, Paul is, yeah, under house arrest. Onesimus is fleeing, confused, uncertain about whatever's going on, and yet they're making all this build up. If anything, you can kind of see like uh, the idea, uh, again, I'm just a killer example. You can see like a casino just spit rewards. Somebody who is not able to sign to things, looking at this and seeing like two two prisoners or one escapee talking to a prisoner saying, you know, what's, what's going on there? This is not worthy of my viewing. This is not worthy of my attention. This is not worthy of my, this is not worthy of my time. You know, if you want, you want to talk to that prisoner, go ahead, go waste your time talking to that prisoner who's under house arrest. Meanwhile, God is seeing this as, well, there's, there's going to be rewards for what's happening here. So, I don't know if you see it through that viewpoint. So, yeah, I just wanted to present that as a thought, present that as a possibility, as some way to also see this through the book of Philemon. As we, again, 2 Timothy 2, 7, can what Paul says in this book. Consider what Paul says in this epistle. And then we add your thoughts, anything you may want to add into everything. If anybody out there has a question, they would have as one of the people. Yeah. Whether it's Paul, Philemon, or in essence. Anything, anything. So yeah, there's that, and then uh, I guess another thing is: Do you think through this epistle that Paul would that Paul knew Philemon would take an essence back? I would have to say yes. He must have knew, like you said, he must have knew Philemon. He's trust him. Trust him. If he didn't know him like that, why would you bother writing a letter if you knew you got to be rejected? I think Paul knew all along. Paul knew finally been long enough that this is a guy that I can write a letter to. So he'll accept the message back and forgive him. And all will be good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's my personal. Yeah. 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 In verse 21, in Philemon 121, he even says uh, some points that he makes you know, regarding Philemon. He says this. In regards to Philemon about Onesimus, he says, having confidence in thy obedience. So he has he has confidence. We'll, we'll dig into that as we continue verse by verse. He says, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I said. So everything that I write, you know, I'm saying, do A, B, C, and one, two, three. I know you're going to do more. I have confidence in your obedience. You're going to do even more than I said. And then he says in verse 22, but everything I'm telling you about my uh, Onesimus and the situation that's come up to me that I'm giving to you. Also, there's more that I will need from you. I'm going to need you to prepare me a lodging, uh, you know, prepare me a place to stay. So he, I would say that he trusts Philemon so much that he's saying, okay, I'm going to throw this in your lap, and then I need more. Yeah, I think you're right. So he says, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. see that there and that's that's the prayer working affection that's not um philemon praying that god would zap a log cabin show up but as paul uh, i'm sorry as as philemon prays he's going to be praying being thankful that paul needs a place to be staying and that 
the Philemon, he would say, Lord, I, you know, I'm thankful that I have that opportunity to set something up. And I'm thankful that there is a judgment seat that I, yeah, and this is, again, I don't know what Philemon prayed, but this is the grace doctrine working. That uh, he says that um, I trust that through your prayers I shall be given to you. So Philemon would pray something to the effect of, I'm thankful that I am the ambassador on the scene who can do something to make this happen. Uh, that I can go out with my own uh, money or something and, and establish, you know, a hotel room at the Howard Johnson. Well, since Paul, well, since Paul traveled around and set up churches, and he was, I would think, Philemon's spiritual authority, even though he was giving him. Um, a little wiggle room in there if he didn't. But I mean, I would think the weight of Paul's letter and the authority that he held as he set up churches and went back and established them more and more, that he pretty much could figure that Philemon was going to, as he asked, because he was the authority. Yeah. yeah, and he even talked about that in those verses where he had said, you know, as, as the authority, he says that... Uh, uh, though I might, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, you know, because you know, enjoin, I can order you. I've got, I am the authority, and I can order you because I'd rather beseech you. In verse uh, nine, so it's, it's me being the authority, I can tell you what to do, but I'd rather ask you instead of order you. Right. And then in the end, he says, "I know you're. I have confidence in your obedience. You'll end up doing more than I say." So, but yeah, that you're right. You're exactly right. That calls the. The authority on the scene, he's the pattern, he's the apostle, he's one of the most gentle. So, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we see that there. You know, if we knew that Paul had a hunch, or more than a hunch, that Philemon would take an SNS back, it's Paul, I'd say Paul would definitely had an idea to do so. And you see all this. This is where this kind of goes. But then another question is uh, you've got an estimate. He goes through everything he goes through. Time goes on. What do you think the Colossians thought about an estimate before and after? Because before he was a servant of Philemon. Then he runs away. Comes back, he's accepted, he's plugged back in. Now what do they think about him? And of course, we know from Colossians 4, 9, he's a faithful and loved brother. He's, he's an ambassador. He's a man on the scene. But what do the Colossians make of all this? Depends if they're saved or not. Yeah. If you're living in Colossae for, say, 45 years, 55 years, 65 years, and you see this happen, this is one event out of Oh, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Well, I, and I take that. I need to qualify what I just said because even uh, saved people still have their own opinions. And just because they're saved, that doesn't mean everybody on magic wand came around and all of a sudden everybody's graceful and all that. There are still saved people out there that, that could use another lesson in grace and so yeah. on. So. I'm sure there were a lot of mixed mixed reactions and feelings. And, yeah, yeah. But bottom line, it comes down to what Philemon chose to do with them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we see that. I think, uh, like we saw, like we had mentioned before, I think it was Colossians 4, verse 9. We studied this multiple weeks. Uh, it says, uh, Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So Onesimus makes known all the things that are being done and tells them to the Colossians. So he's someone who's going to broadcast everything that Paul does and makes known. Uh, they're trustworthy enough, uh, you know, a faithful and beloved brother. He's faithful, he's beloved, he's, he's trustworthy enough to make known everything that's being done. Paul trusts him enough to, you know, let him know. And he's also, he's 
also there with Tychicus. And Tychicus was someone who went out and did things to the local churches. So now he's kind of acquainted with Tychicus, or he's there on the scene with Tychicus. Is it possible Tychicus could have gone with him, Onesimus, uh, and they came back together? Uh, now, I mean, I'm just reading these verses now, and it could well be. I mean, maybe I'm not reading the verses properly or the flow. It says, but I have sent unto you, and then with, a, with Onesimus. Meaning, did they travel together, or does that mean that also Onesimus can... Well, Onesimus is a Colossian. You know that from... Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it could have been, it could have been, but you, know, you see Tychicus there with him in this case. So, he has growth, is, you know what I mean, and she's clearly noticing this and welcoming it. Those were kind of the things we wanted to go through, and it's kind of like right, right, right at uh, eight o'clock. So those were kind of the questions I wanted to go through, and then now I want to leave it open for any kind of open, open question, open thought on anything, open comments on anything we're kind of going through, but uh, or any kind of verses, any kind of study, anything. Uh, but mainly, this is what I wanted to do: is just kind of dig into the mind a little bit of uh, considering what Paul has to say about Philemon. And, using Second Timothy as verses, where we kind of looked at all the pattern, the apostle, the mature saint, who is given a tough situation, kind of falls into his lap. We looked at multiple questions, looking into the mind of, not only the mind of Christ, but the mind of Paul going through this. Then, of course, jumping into Philemon, you know, Philemon the saint, seeing that he's the mature saint who was given a tough situation from Paul, and he had to resolve it bring it to conclusion on its own, and then going into the mind of Onesimus and seeing how he was you know, the one in a tough situation, and he had to be dependent upon mature saints to resolve his situation to conclusion properly. Did you say that Paul, sorry, Gloria? No, no, that's feedback. When I talk, I get feedback too, and I think someone else is talking. I wasn't talking. I oh. think that's your feedback. Hmm. Okay. okay. Um, did you say Paul had the authority to tell Philemon to take him back? Yeah, yeah, Paul had the authority, but he didn't. Uh, well, I mean, in what, in what way? I mean, like, what could he have well, he's, He could have said. I don't, I don't understand. Oh, well, with him being the, the pattern mm -hmm. and the, uh, like, he has the authority to yell at the uh, Corinthians. And the Corinthians could have sat back and said, well, you're you're not my boss. I can go ahead and act however I feel like. I can, I can fornicate. I can do what I want. It's my life. But Paul, God you know, gives to Paul the revelation of the mystery. He's the apostle. He's the pattern. He's the one who God sets up with churches um he can, he can let them know i guess he's our pattern but is that pattern uh there's nobody today that's oh, given that no, kind not, of authority is there i like that we we allow ourselves i mean i know our, there's some churches that do it <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Different, like, I could say different religions or religious churches would say that the pastor tells me yeah. stuff like that. Uh, we can, I mean, we can, depending on how much we want to, I say, learn or grow, but even that, I'm not looking to really say it like you think of in a religious, mm -hmm. Baptist, Catholic type of way. Uh, you know, people people learn and say, but pretty much like, like we do here is is more we can ask questions and grow and learn and and, and any kind of whether private questions to how should about this. Even when we give the answer, it's more here's the information for your benefit. You can do with it as you see fit because we're all individuals who will give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the only thing when we would be say more. Uh, Authoritative is if someone comes to the scene and saying, well, I'd like to 
uh, more, more like Corinthian issues. So we'd say, well, I'd like to show you this. Uh, literally, and I'd plug that into the church. And I'd say, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. In fact, uh, we're authoritatively going to stop you from doing that. Well, I mean, that power can always be abused, but I think the leaders of a church do have authority over those that um, are under them. As a shepherd of the church, they are there to protect the church from false um, teachers and stuff like that. I mean, Paul even said, when I get there, I don't want to have to discipline you. Um, you know, he kind of said, I already judged him, you know, that type of thing. I mean... I think each church has its own authorities. Right? I guess uh, uh, it depends. And, and I think it's like, well, the Red Assembly, some churches do have those type of setups where, um, like you said, they they will say, if you're going to join us, we're going to establish this type of authority and uh, just run things like, we're going to run the show like this. This is, you know, you're under our umbrella now, and we'll, we'll protect you, but we're also going to keep you in this box, or we're going to, you know, something like that, where we're going to keep you under the strict thing, strict guidelines. If we see, and if we see you uh, not showing up for church three times in a row, we're going to, we're going to knock on your front door. If we don't see you doing X, Y, Z, yeah. then one That would be abuse. To me, that's abuse yeah. Yeah. of the power. But I think they do have a certain authority over their uh, congregation as far as just listening to something on the radio. Their uh, pastor said someone to have a word from God I'm supposed to tell you. And he said, um, I'm the shepherd of this church. Something I think God would have let me know that too. And I can't let you speak. And so, you know, I mean, he was trying to protect the sheep from maybe a false message from, you know, someone claiming to be a prophet. They do have some of the authority over you. I don't, it's not life and death. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say that makes sense. I would say that makes sense. Yeah. You, you, we, we do, we are to protect people from false doctrines, false gospels, false information. So, uh, and that point, authority, authority from wrong information, authority from false beliefs would be the right thing. Uh, I don't think, is this where you were going with this, Loretta, or are you talking about more actual, don't do this, don't do that type of authority? I mean, 2 Corinthians one twenty four says, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. I mean, what's that dominion over your faith? I mean, I, I get what Gloria is saying, yeah. and I think that's why we have different denominations and we have statements of faith, and you have to sign their statement of faith if you want to join, and you have to join the church so that they can hold you accountable. Yeah. Like, you, you can't teach this or do that or whatever, which makes it hard, because if you're searching for the truth and you're in a, a denomination, and then you're, you know, like with race people, and you realize, oh, wow, a lot of this is what do I do now? Yeah. You pretty much have to leave. Because, yeah. I mean, and it's like, who makes people dominion over your faith? I mean. Well, I, mean, I think like the Catholic Church, yeah. they have these this hierarchy that's way out of line. Yeah. You know. You know, a few. Right. We could, they I, think really, they do, they, I think yeah, they do I mean, abuse. You know, if you didn't agree with something, they would have a meeting and take a vote on it and it's like if if you weren't willing to comply to whatever that thing was, and you pretty much had to leave. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, this is stupid. abuse. It was stupid thing. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, it's in a way we give them. This is what I'm saying. We we when we join a church, we give them. We agree to follow their authority. They don't really have any authority over us other than they can say you have to leave their particular church. That's really, you know. And we go well, I, we go find another one that's more, you know, in line with what we're doing. But Paul did set up each church 
with elders, and those elders did her hold a certain amount of authority to keep that church in line and in truth. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think of I think of situations where women's Bible studies have gotten crazy. Yeah. The people, the women that are putting out books, and the women are that are following them. And I wish pastors would step up and say, no, not in my church. We're not studying that type of material, you know, and they don't, as far as I'm concerned, they don't do that enough. Yeah. Yeah. That all gets, but definitely. It, it all gets abuse. kind of touchy, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, and I think that's when you, you don't try to change the church. You move yeah. on. To one have to. that believes the way you believe, or the way that you know, and then has, and then has grace, and always with the goal to restore you to unity with the church, not to excommunicate you, not to you know. I mean, if they're harsh and just pushing you out the door, that's not with the right mind. They do want to restore you, but in truth, yeah. But there aren't very many churches like that that are actually teaching truth. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, most of it. When I was young, I mean, literally, you couldn't play cards, you could dance, you couldn't go to a movie, you, you know, everyone, yeah, but they're done. Everything was wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, that's not that's not those things weren't even biblical. I mean, those were like traditions of men, I would say. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't we couldn't lay anything on the Bible. Yeah. And yeah, that's my, and that's what my mom grew up in. So that's what she passed on to us. And there were just, you know, yeah. things that we couldn't say that weren't really that bad. But to my mom, they were bad. So I know I understand what you're saying. But I do think, like I said, Paul went around and set up elders for a purpose at each church. Yeah, they had some kind of authority. Yeah, and then, yeah. And well, Paul, yeah, it's just tough. Though, because a lot of times they're wrong. I mean, biblically, you know. Well, so you you kind of have to determine whether they're actually following scripture, following Paul. You know, you can't. Well, just, I mean, from following church history, I see where they. Well, we saw in Paul. He says, you know, everyone in Asia has already left me. So they started departing from the truth right away. So no wonder it's so yeah. crazy now. Yeah, I mean, there was always a group. Uh, like this one history project that I'm listening to, the Silver Line, Silver Line of Truth. There was always a group of people that had truth, but mostly the church of that age, which is the Catholic Church, killed them and destroyed their work. Yeah. yeah. So then they and everywhere because God was preserving His Word through the, through like He said, multiplicity of copies. They copied, copy, copy, and copy because when they were killed. They're destroyed, so they were always making more copies. So, um, you know, if, if especially because even if we look at the the Baptist churches that I went to and that you and Nazarene, a lot of what they're teaching is from the Catholic mindset. We oh, yeah. we just don't even know it anymore. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the Catholic mindset is abusive when they would kill people. Yeah. That didn't say that Mary was the mother of God. If you didn't believe that, they killed you. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's kind of trickled down into some churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Absolutely. <laughs> that's even what uh, Ryan had posted last week about uh, Justin Martyr. Um, he was the one I had translated everything into English. And then uh, I got Tyndale. Wasn't that Tyndale? Uh, I'm sorry, Tyndale, I'm sorry. Yeah. I said yeah, Justin Martin. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, William, T William Tyndale. Yeah, he was. He was Martin. Yeah. 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 Yep. But we I'm do sorry. need authority. We do need some authority in our church. It's just got to be the right kind of authority. Yes. Yes. Well, and see, that's the thing. When you get a group of people together, somebody always is going to emerge as a leader of sorts. Whether they're called the president or whether it's just, uh, let's go ask Charlie about it, you know, that kind of thing. And Paul was making sure when he had certain elders that he had the right people in place who were mature enough and understood 
you know, the gospel and, and the doctrine enough that they would give appropriate answers and, and handle things appropriately. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, when Paul said, uh, Paul, I remember reading and studying Titus. We did that verse by verse a couple of years ago. And he sent out Titus to the island of Crete to set up elders uh, in, in every city. And from we studying that back in, what, the year 69 to where we are now, the elders and bishops and deacons of them, you know, in those days where they point things in verbatim from what Paul said and from what Titus said, so what we have now from the church up your street, uh, they're you know they're destroying or manipulating the authority that they've been given mm -hmm. compared to what they did when Titus told them, "Here's look, here's what we're going to do." Paul just mm -hmm. told me to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's two different stories. So we do get abuse, and we do get authority abuse. It went from the very people who said that we're not going to do it because we're getting scripture abuse, we're getting scripture twisting. So we get authority to Right, in this history project, like they said, when we did the tricklings of writings from the church fathers, as they called them, it looked totally different than the churches Paul set up. And that wasn't even that many years. You know, and and then the I mean, Catholic Church up this hierarchy where eventually they became the government. You know, I mean, even they just had too much power. And it was nothing like the churches Paul set up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we see. We even see in uh, Philemon. What was it? He has the church in his house there. In uh, verse 2, is it? Yeah, verse 2. He says the church in his house. So we go from that to something totally different in a matter of years. Just as the example. But, I mean, that's kind of what you would get if you... If the failure to rightly divide takes place, now you're getting you're getting people who may not know whether they should be getting ready for a physical kingdom on earth, and you need to have your works perfect. Your your you have to have your flesh perfect, your work perfect, your life perfect, and you, know, you can't do it. So you have to yeah, how's that you make for you? yeah, you gotta make something up. And then you're reading all about Paul, who's saying something totally different, getting ready for heavenly places with a heavenly purpose, with a heavenly dominion, and you don't know how to make heads from tails on them. So the only thing you can do is start to pretend you know what they're talking about. You've got to start manipulating. Well, and that's exactly why the Catholic Church didn't want Bibles in everyone's hands, because then everyone would know that what they were doing was wrong, was yeah. not scriptural. And that's, I think that's when a congregation can be led astray, is when they don't know what's in the Word. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very easily so. Catholics never studied the Bible. Yeah, they still don't. They, oh, they weren't supposed to. They were just supposed to listen to church tradition, right? That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So. Trust me. Yeah, you guys have the experience. Well, I don't think every Catholic church is like that because I know of some Catholic church that they actually read, teach from the Bible and stuff like that. Well, they do read, they do read from it, but they don't teach about it because every Sunday they read from, uh, I think they read about maybe two, no, they probably read about five, five to ten verses. Oh, they have three, three separate readings. They, they have three separate readings, yeah. So I don't know if that's what you mean. But an in-depth Bible study about what the words actually mean, they, they don't do that. Now we had a Bible blitz. They started that many years ago when we were still Catholics. And uh, it was one hour, and I mean 60 minutes, not 59 minutes and not 61 minutes. And when they were done, they were done. They went through a whole – am I saying this right now? They went through a whole – They went through a whole, whole book. 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 Yeah. They went through in an a, hour. a whole book in an hour. And you couldn't ask any questions. But in some denomination, they know the you know the yeah. verses, the memorized oh, yeah. like Valerie and Augie. They're really in, you know. Memorizing but it's verses. it's wrong, it's you know, wrong studying. It's not like a rightly dividing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they know. It's like you, they can, you know, like 
we were talking, they know what is the birds, you know, they memorize. Yeah. 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 Really? But if they, you know, if like me, I'm not I'm not really met some of the verses, but I mean it's like ooh, it's like a verse like the wrong one for the Israel. Yeah. yeah. Not for but yeah. they're studying really they're studying like, you know. Concept rather than memorizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I had a, her her comes to a private religious school. I don't I don't remember what what religion, but they were required. The children were required every week to learn X number of verses, and they had to stand up and prove that they knew it. So that you know, some of them go way back to memorizing. You know, but do they understand? I um, would. <laughs> think there's certain verses that they didn't want them and they probably went to certain because i mean i'm not saying that someone in a in a in a catholic church can't be saved but you can't be saved by catholic doctrine it is wrong right, right. You're not by baptism mary of god these traditions are on right right yeah and mary was was born with sin she was right. not born with our sin yeah, that's right. That's right. You can't be safe through wrong information, wrong doctrine. So, you know, memorizing verse upon verse is one thing, but you know, you can't be saved by wrong doctrine. So, yeah, or or if they believe that Jesus, you know, died for our sin, they they say, but you know, they study in the right wrong doctrine, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like right. the Catholic, you know. That's true. Yeah, I believe that you know still. And they're really big on the, uh, replacement theology, aren't they? Oh yeah, so, yeah. And yeah. so that's that's going to set you on the wrong path for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I remember going to my grandmother's funeral, and when you first walked in, it said "Welcome to the Kingdom," and we we're like, "Uh," <laughs> because they put up signs. They put up signs. They were they were trying to make us at the least, and uh, they wanted to have a funeral for her, of course, and, and it, was, it was a Catholic funeral. And when you walked in, it, it said, welcome to the kingdom, you know, as in Israel's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And they don't know heaven, they don't know prophecy from history. So it was, it was welcome to the kingdom. We were like, mm. even, even, even your grandpa passed away, the book of life. Uh, yeah, no? yeah, they wrote his name in the book of yeah. life. And they just handed this little plastic that okay his name's in the book of life now we're like no. <laughs> well yeah, and don't, yeah. don't they seem to go to israel for their authority um structure the priests and i mean don't oh, they yeah. Yeah. which which yeah. we don't do today right right yeah because pre the, the whole point of a priest <laughs> is for an earth uh israel's earthly kingdom we see that in everything from uh you know, zechariah to leviticus um, that they were, I mean, if they wanted to follow priestly duties, they should be cutting off, uh, and cutting the blood out of the uh, bulls and goats and everything else into the, you know, the tabernacle and the basin of the uh, thing you find in the book of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. That's what it's not. And no shopping on Sunday. Oh, yeah. On the Sabbath. Excuse me, on the Sabbath. No work on the Sabbath. Yeah. Well, the Sabbath is Friday night this Saturday. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's why I changed from Sunday to yeah. Sabbath. But yeah, but yeah, all these different uh, things they talk about. When, I mean, and the fact that the Pope can't sin, right? I mean, his word and what he says is over scripture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely a Catholic doctrine, and that is definitely wrong. Right. Nothing, nothing is over scripture. Well, I have a who... Uh, his wife was uh, grew up Catholic, uh, and he I can't remember up, but he I'm using air quotes converted to Catholic just so they could marry. Um, and I was talking with him about uh, the Catholic and uh, the Catholic like what is salvation and stuff like that. And he said uh, basically. He's saved because no works were needed. Um, he doesn't believe uh, um, 
like marries the true uh or the father or the mother of god and uh all of that stuff because i was asking him about that and he's like yeah it's not really what is being taught really anymore at least at his uh catholic church that he goes to um so there's that well he could be saved if he trusts the gospel and then he you know marries into uh you know catholic woman catholic church there's there could be tons of saved people inside of the catholic church and inside we don't even know that. i find the catholics are or like cafeteria style i want one of the i don't want one of those and they pick and choose what they what they want to believe. You know, even though the priests or whoever may say you have to do X, Y, and Z, they go through the motions, but truly they don't. They just pick and choose. Yeah. Yeah. So isn't it kind of odd that even uh, <clears throat> Like even Baptist churches and so forth think that the members of the body of Christ are priests. Oh. I don't know how they do that. I mean, do they think that we're going to go into the millennium and that God is going to have us be priests? I mean, I never really thought about it. They don't separate Peter's teaching for the for is not for right, us and right. we're prophets priests and kings isn't that where is that in, in oh, scripture i see i see really, i think in, uh, oh, i think it's in uh, chapter one or chapter two uh <laughs> I think it's uh ch chapter one oh, chapter one verse six and uh, so if you think this is you and i know none of us here do but if you did you know if you're the baptist you're the catholic you're the non-denominational church that doesn't rightly divide and you get to Revelation chapter number six, and you don't know Romans from Revelation, and you're going to say that he has made us, you know, as in me and you and everyone in the pew, you know, in front of you and in back of you, kings and priests. Yeah, okay. So. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in the, in the Baptist church, and I've never heard of rightly dividing so they, to me, they're way off as far as they do the replacement theology. Um, yeah, Matthew 24 oh, yeah. is, you know, that one I heard a lot. We saw the movie where the razor's buzzing in the sink because the person disappeared. I mean, huh. wait, back when I, was a kid, I remember hearing that. See, well, Matthew 24 is still a big deal. Everyone, every, Whenever there's an earthquake or there's a nation that's about to go to war, they run to Matthew chapter 24, and that's, you know, essentially us today, mm -hmm. earthquakes, famines, rumors of wars, and they go, oh, well, that's, that's prophecy for right here, right now, today, being fulfilled. We're like, no, no, it's not. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. That's why right dividing does make sense, so much sense. Yeah. 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 Helps clear things up quite a bit. You know, but everyone's looking for the wrong, wrong things. And then uh, you know, two wrong positions fighting things out when both of them are wrong and they're not going to get to the right thing as they continue to fight. Two different, two different sides of a wrong. wrong <laughs> argument. So, yeah. But yeah, uh, you know, getting back to what Ryan was saying, yeah, you know, you could have you can have somebody who trusts the gospel and you know, kind of goes you know, in that situation you were explaining. You know, they they marry someone that they love. They go to you know the the, the Catholic Catholic Church in this case, Catholic religion, and they kind of they say like, well, you know, we're going through this. We kind of kind of going to go through the motions. We want to be with somebody. In this case, you know, your friend is with the the lady and uh, his wife and uh, things aren't maybe the way they used to be you know 30 years ago when, when we were Catholics we were per se but uh, if he trusts the gospel the gospel saved him uh, so he's 
he's good to go. He's you know, God to the faith of the operation of God, Colossians 2.11, saved him. And, and he's in the Catholic religion. But the Catholic religion can't get him out of what the gospel got him into. He's still sealed. Yeah, he's still sealed. And we don't know how many other people are in there. Right. You know, Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, the Mormon Church, the Jew, uh, Jewish Church, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, the Jehovah's Witness Church. We don't know how many people are actually truly saved. So, and that's why we never say that uh, you have to be a mid acts dispensational right to biter in order to be saved, because that's that's not true. You know, if you want to learn and grow and understand your Bible and Oh, what's going on? Then you really want to take this position, this doctrinal position, and plug into it a lot from it so that your Bible makes total sense, or I'd say a lot of sense, a lot of sense. But to be saved, you don't have to. Because I, I, as I understand, even in the Baptist church, one week you can hear 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 as the gospel. Then the next week you walk in, you can hear it as John 3, 16. And then you might hear it as you want to come down to give your heart. Lord, give your Lord and make Jesus the Lord of your life. Then next week again, it's going to be First Corinthians fifteen one through four, just something different in the Baptist Church every week. So, well, I, I mean, I don't know who's who Ryan's talking about, and I have heard of other priests that were actually like they were saved, but it might be if he knows anything about salvation, he before he got to the wrong church because. That would be more of an exception than a right. rule as far as actually coming salvation. Yeah. I have a girlfriend that's I actually I have two girlfriends that were mar married to Roman Catholic. Well, one of them passed away, but um, married to Catholic. And they <laughs> pick up scripture because they trust what the, they don't think they can understand it. They just trust what the priest says. They'll not pick it up for themselves. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So this was pretty much uh, yeah, look, we were looking to go tonight, kind of going through and considering what Paul has to say by Lehman and kind of going into discussions like this. This was all kind of exactly what we were looking to do, down to the decimal. Point. If anyone had any to add, this was exactly what we were looking to do. Uh, just one more thing, this Grace History Project, I listened to Lesson 22, and it tells, talks about, uh, uh, I don't know if I've got the term right, Paulicians. Paulicians, yeah. yeah. Um, which gives you insight into the fact that, like a lot of people say, Darby come up with, did he make it up? There really is a group of people that believe like us that always yeah. there yeah. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. it really, I don't know, it made such a difference to know you have something to say to people that laugh at you and say, you made that up, or you know, John Darby made um, that up. Yeah. Um, you know, never heard that before. No, they these people were persecuted for the same beliefs we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the Paulicians. Yeah, you hear about them even in the uh, Dispensational Bible Institute. Uh, Terry talks about the Paulicians as well. Oh. Yeah, I remember that. yeah, I'll have to listen to that some more. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if anyone else has anything else. Those are all good. Uh, I believe we'll be back here Sunday. We'll do verse by verse. We'll be back here on Wednesday. We'll do another study. Yeah, that was about it. Just kind of wanted to dig a little bit into the mindset of Paul, the mind of Christ, the mind of Philemon, and the mind of Vanessa. Let's kind of put ourselves in their shoes tonight. It would be like to kind of go into this situation to their perspective as much as we could, kind of answer some old ones. And kind of do a little, exactly what we did. If there's anything else, we'll wrap up here. Okay, I think I'm going to be I'm going to be traveling this weekend. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be able to catch up with you on Sunday. But um, if the weather lets me to travel, which it doesn't look really good right now, so I might not be there. But I will listen to the replay. Sure, sure, no problem. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night. Good night. Thanks for joining. Yes. Thanks for the conversation. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.